It's to be here in South Wairarapa. Can I acknowledge uh, the local mayor, Martin Connolly? Fantastic to have you here. Uh, and also uh, Kieran McAnulty, my ministerial colleague. We're here today to talk about water infrastructure. We know that we've got some big challenges ahead as a country when it comes to our water infrastructure, which in many cases is poor and getting worse. Last year alone, a million New Zealanders lived with tap water that didn't meet uh, drinking water standards. An estimated 35,000 New Zealanders each year are getting sick from drinking water that doesn't meet international benchmarks. 25% of our wastewater plants are running on expired consents. In 2020-2021, uh, New Zealand experienced 2,750 dry weather wastewater overflows. It's estimated that around $120 to $180 billion is needed to bring our water infrastructure up to scratch over the next 30 years. The cost on that for households could be substantial. Rates rises could be between $4,000 and $9,000 per annum over that period of time if we don't do something to change the way we deliver water infrastructure so that we're delivering it in the most efficient and effective way possible. This is a major cost of living issue that is going to face New Zealanders in the coming decades. We can't simply kick the can down the road and avoid making the tough decisions. But we have also listened to feedback that we've received on the uh, water reform proposals that we've had out to date. We've heard the feedback that the solution that we had put forward was too centralised and didn't have enough provision for local voice. When I became Prime Minister and appointed Karen McAnulty as Minister for Local Government, I asked him to go back and reconsult with local communities to see if we could find a way forward that deals with the very pressing issues of our water infrastructure deficit, but delivers something that local communities can get behind. We've taken a lot of that feedback on board. The government will be establishing 10 regionally led local water entities. We believe that this strikes the right balance between ensuring cost savings in the delivery of water infrastructure while also ensuring that those water entities are strongly grounded in their local communities. Every council will be represented around the table in guiding those local water entities. Households will still see significant savings of between $2,700 to $5,400 per year over the relevant period. Without, water, without this water reform, those households would be facing significantly higher rates increases. Those who are arguing against affordable water reforms are effectively arguing for higher rates and a higher cost of living for New Zealanders. I'll now hand over to Kieran uh, McAnulty, who's going to give you some more details on the proposals, uh, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. So here's the guts of it. Up to $180 billion local councils need to find, and they can't do it by themselves, because councils are individually either at their debt cap, or if they're not, their communities can't afford to pay any higher rates. That's causing the problem. So individually, they're stuck. If they try to work together through a CCO, like Wellington Water, there's a limit to that because the debt that councils hold on their balance sheet still stays there. And if they try and do shared services, it doesn't allow councils to borrow the money they need to be able to fund this. The water infrastructure will be funded through borrowing. It's about how we make that borrowing affordable. So we explored all the alternatives put forward through communities for local democracy or even the National Party and it didn't stack up. The only way to make this work financially for ratepayers and local communities is to have a separate entity that's still owned by the council but is run independently by an independent governing body. That's the only way that credit agencies will allow them to borrow at the extent that they needed. So that's the rationale behind the changes. Uh, as Associate Minister, I toured every rural and regional council in the country, all 55, and some of them said that they'd never had a government minister visit them ever. I listened to what they had to say. Every single one of them said that reform was required, that they can't do it by themselves, but every single one of them said that they wanted their local voice to be included. So we wanted to look at how we can make it as regionally done as possible. If we went 16 entities, we wouldn't have got the scale required 
to allow for the borrowing that is needed. It would have left communities like uh, the unitary authorities, Tairawhiti and those at the top of the south, Northland, West Coast, totally isolated, set up for disaster, and I couldn't in good conscience propose that to Cabinet. So that's why we set it on 10. So Auckland and Northland go together. Tairawhiti and Hawke's Bay go together. The top of the south form one entity across the three unitary authorities there. The west coast, who said themselves they can't do it by themselves, they go in with Canterbury and Otago and Southland go together. I briefed the mayors this morning and I have to say that the feedback has been positive. I can almost guarantee, well I can guarantee, that there will be more mayors that support this proposal than supported the last one because they recognise that with a seat at the table guaranteed for every mayor in the country, they'll be able to ensure that the priorities of their local communities are heard, but they'll be able to achieve the scale that's needed to the, to the, the investment that they have to do. Why have you retained the 50-50 co-governance on the regional representative groups? So let, let's be clear about this. It's not co-governance and it wasn't co-governance. These, these entities will be governed by a skills-based board appointed for their knowledge and expertise around water and other issues. Uh, there will be regional advisory groups that will include representation from Mana Whenua and, of course, representation from every local council, but, as we've just indicated. But, uh, there will be an opportunity for people to have a say in, within local communities, including Mana Whenua, in how their water uh, is delivered uh, and their priorities for water. The advisory groups are only one form of that. There's also an ability, for example, for the uh, Tamana Otawai statements, and we've introduced us an equivalent for other significant interested parties in water use to also have a say in that. But it is a 50-50 split on those groups, right? On the representative groups, that's correct. So